Hi, my name is Andrew Dudley and this is Earth Live, a webcast featuring interviews with people working on the front lines of conservation. Today we're joined by Peter Knight from Lafayette in California. Peter, welcome to Earth. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, great, great sir, thank you. So can I ask you what it is that you do? So I am the CEO of an organization called Wild Aid, based in San Francisco. I'm just outside San Francisco. And what we do is, uh, it's kind of unique. We try and address the demand for endangered species products. So uh, we are trying to stop people from wanting to consume things like rhino horn, elephant ivory, and shark fin. And when did you uh, realize that you were going to devote your career to this, to, to conservation? Boy, a long time ago. So um, I actually left uh, London School of Economics with a degree in economics and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was playing in a band and all kinds of other things and shenanigans. And uh, um, I started doing some volunteer work for Greenpeace. Um, and I did sort of decide that rather than going just to make money, um, I wanted to do something to maybe try in some small way and make the world a better place. And so um, I didn't really want to get into politics. I think there's a lot of politics that goes backwards and forwards like a ping pong game. And I figured that environmentalism was actually a really important thing that, you know, maybe ultimately can bring human beings together. And we realize that our commonalities are less than our differences. And we're all on the same planet. We've all got to share a planet. So we better make a good job of it. So Peter, let's take a moment to check out one of your public service messages that you've run with Jackie Chan tackling the ivory trade. If you're buying rhino horn, you may be paying for more than just horn. You're paying for guns, bullets, poison arrows, chainsaw, axes, and machetes to hack off the face of the rhino. And you are paying for the life of a beautiful creature. So please tell your friends and relatives, never buy products made from rhino horn. When the buying stops, the killing can do. So Peter, can I ask you what the impact has been uh, f towards these campaigns in Asia? Well, I should, I should add that, you know, there's been tremendous support, not just from Asian celebrities, but also from the media. So these public service messages we do, 30 second public service messages, they go out prime time. And last year in China, for example, we had $250 million worth of donated media space. So these are big campaigns. They're not like a few posters or something like that. These are mass media campaigns. And we've seen a lot of impact from initially you know, in Taiwan, which was the, the biggest um, importer of rhino horn back in 1993, basically Taiwan got switched off wildlife consumption. They were probably one of the number one culprits and within two or three years of very intensive campaign with EIA and then outreach with celebrities. Um, people just got it and they said, we're not going to do it anymore. So we've seen numbers, uh, for example, in China recently, there was an 80% decline in the imports of shark fin in China over a three year period. Uh, on rhino horn, uh, the price is down by two thirds uh, of rhino horn. People said, oh, the, the insatiable demand for rhino horn. It's like, well, guess what? It's gone down considerably because the price has gone down by two thirds and the supply has gone down at the same time, too. So you're definitely making impact there. And then elephant ivory, again, more than two thirds decline in the price of elephant ivory. And what's this translated to in the field is that the elephant poaching in places like Kenya and Mozambique has gone down dramatically as the price has gone down. Um, and rhinos recently, really good news, actually one of the few COVID silver linings, if there are any, um, was the, the rhino poaching in South Africa was down by 53% in the first six months of this year. So now, finally, the rhino poaching is going down again. Wow, congratulations. Well, so it's, it's, a lot, it's a huge effort, obviously, not just us. It's the, it's the anti-poaching in the field. But you need to do all these things at the same time. You need to be you know, making sure you've got good enforcement, uh, making sure you're stopping smuggling, and then you also need to be educating the public and moving them away from consuming this product, which is obviously the long-term solution to this. Mm -hmm. And you speak about COVID then, so you, you guys made the distinction between a wet market and a, a live animal market. So yeah, I mean, I mean, the term wet market means any market that doesn't have permanent refrigeration, you know, that brings in ice. So every farmer's market in the US is a wet market. You know, every fish market in the world pretty much is a wet market. So uh, wet market is the wrong term. What it, and and the, the problem is the live wildlife, right? The problem is having live wildlife there. And so um, that is uh, that's obviously thought to be a source for COVID. Um, we don't know yet. We know we think that it was originated in horseshoe bats. 
and that it was probably transmitted to human beings via another animal. And they think the only candidate that's been put up so far as pangolins, small scaly anteaters. Um, but we know SARS came from those markets through civet cats. Um, and we know that these markets are breeding grounds for disease because the conditions the animals are kept in, the stress that they have, the mixing together of species like bats and civet cats and pangolins and all different sorts of animals are the perfect conditions, the, the high stress, perfect conditions for transmission of disease. And so you, almost a, a laboratory design on how to get disease out of animals and cross jump species. So thankfully, China has... Um, learned its lesson this time. They didn't really, uh, with SARS, when it's civet cats and bats, they closed down these markets and they reopened them again later. Uh, this time, we believe that the closures are going to be permanent. They've already closed those markets. Uh, they've shut down 80,000 breeding facilities for wildlife across China. Incredible, the scale of this industry. Um, but they seem to be taking it very seriously. So our task now is to help the Chinese government by helping to educate people who are potential consumers not to consume these products. And so what is the role of CITES, so the Wildlife Trade Agreement? How do you see that in preventing future pandemics? Well, CITES is, um, you know, a UN convention which is supposed to regulate trade in wildlife. And so it bans trade in things like ivory. It allows trade in other species that are not seen as threatened and it's supposed to regulate it, which doesn't always work that well. But um, the good news is, is that now I think it's over 190 countries have adopted CITES and many of those countries have CITES as part of their domestic legislation. So if ivory trade is banned through CITES, it automatically gets banned in, say, Nigeria. Um, so the advantage of doing something to protect wildlife for COVID through CITES is the infrastructure is already there. Um, you'd need to change the convention because it's all been about endangerment of species. It hasn't had a health aspect. But if you could change CITES to say we can also prohibit trade in species for disease transmission reasons, then it could be a quite a quick tool to get legislation up. And there are particular species which um, have high virus loads and we know are, are relatively dangerous. So things like bats, for example. Bats, you know, they've been the source of COVID, uh, SARS, uh, MERS and other diseases. And so obviously consuming bats is a really bad idea. Um, and theoretically, you could protect all bats from international trade and by extension, in some cases, from domestic trade through CITES. What are the biggest challenges ahead and what are you most positive about? Well, biggest challenges, I mean, I think, look, overall, um, I think there's been a lot of progress in the last 20 years since I've been working on these issues. I've seen a lot of progress. I've seen us basically save the rhinos twice and save the elephants twice from trade, which is a little bit frustrating because you're kind of like, why are we doing this twice? But unfortunately, human beings, we always go back and try something again. Um, so those have been sort of positive, but the challenges ahead, I think, are, or the opportunities ahead are, are with COVID. Can we, from COVID, learn some lessons that all live wildlife markets should be banned and that we should tra end trade in, in many of these species uh, for human consumption? You know, it's, it's hard to say an absolute blanket ban because many people in Africa, for example, may eat certain types of wild meat or, or bush meat, as it's called there. Um, in uh as part of their diet and it may be not a a luxury item but actually a sort of subsistence item and obviously that's something which is we're not necessarily opposed to but what we are opposed to is the urban consumption of bushmeat of things like particularly things like primates and pangolins you know we know have a lot of viruses um, and are also becoming endangered so i think that's one of the big challenges is can we use covid to say okay this is time now to take this issue seriously if you want to stop a major source of new disease and pandemics, you need to stop the live wildlife trade. And, and what are you most positive about looking ahead? Well, I'm positive about that opportunity that it could, it could um, engender a different attitude toward wildlife in many places around the world, primarily West and Central Africa and Southeast Asia, and indeed China. Um, you know, but what was encouraging in China is when this came out, is the public reaction was not, oh, we have to keep eating these animals. It was like, why on earth are we still allowing people to do this? And so I think part of that has been our ongoing education campaigns over now, like 20 years, that, and people were citing our slogan, that there has been a sensitization of people that this isn't the right thing to do. Um, and so that was very encouraging. Um, you know, I think the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges for sure is climate change and the impact climate change is having. And climate change, unfortunately, is a little bit like the sort of the frog in the hot water type thing. It's not quite as, it's not seen, you know, if thousands of evidence being poached, we've got a crisis and then we'll do something about it. With climate change is this slow drag. It's not that slow, unfortunately. You know, we're here in California. We've, um, I've been inside for probably about 
three weeks this summer because the air quality is so bad because of the fires and the wildfires. And there's no doubt that is, you know, it, it's caused by partly by not letting the forest burn previously, but also climate change is making that much, much worse. So we have real time effects. Will we do anything about it? I don't know. The political will, certainly in the leadership right now, is in, in our country, as you know, is not mm -hmm. is not there. Yeah, meaning America. I'm sorry, not me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Boris. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Boris, Boris is into conservation, I think. Okay, so uh, on a on a pro on a professional level, uh, you must have had some highs and lows in your career. Could could you share what those yeah. were, please? Well, highs. Um, I think you know these are these things are long slogs. People say, are they a marathon or a sprint? I say it's a series of sprints that's a marathon. And you get these odd moments where you're just like, yes, where species are protected, for example. Um, or uh, for shark fin, for me, um, it was when I was watching, I was in China, I was watching uh, uh, a sort of 60 minutes type show from the Chinese government on Chinese state television. And I watched this thing on shark fin. I watched and got like, oh my God, this thing is eviscerating the shark fin trade. This thing is absolutely condemning the shark fin trade. If I made this from my point of view, I wouldn't be able to make this stronger in condemning the shark fin trade. I'm like, this is the Chinese government saying this. And then I'm like, we're there. Mm -hmm. We've got there. If the Chinese government is on board and the people are on board, we already know, we've seen the results, we're there. So it's that kind of thing. It's when a species gets protected, the pangolins in South Africa, um, you know, we were pushing for all pangolins to be protected uh, through CITES, and it was up and go. It got passed unanimously. What, and wow. Nothing ever happens unanimously in CITES. <laughs> There's always somebody. The, the Indonesia like, we want to breed them, we want to breed them, so we're going to protect them. But everybody else was on there. And that was an incredible moment to see that happen. Uh, and then you think, yes, we can do this. We can have it. There's these moments where, you know, you see things. Uh, yes, this is doable. This is not impossible. As for Lowe's, um, you know, I think uh, the, the toughest thing um when you do this work is that you don't actually just have to go and be a campaigner you know if you have an organization you have to manage an organization and managing any uh, organizations has its challenges and so you know you you have decisions you have to make you have things you have to do in an organization that you know is not not always pleasant or easy um you know and that that i think is is when it's tough and when the money is really tight it's tough too Thank you. Uh, for an aspiring conservationist, what advice would you give them? Wow. Um, make some money first would be my first piece of advice. Make your money first and then do it. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, wow. Well, I mean, follow your dream, you know, follow your dream and, and decide what it is you you want to do. Um, I when I started, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But then I met these guys from EIA and I thought they were doing some really cool things with undercover investigations. And I could see how what they were doing was going to be catalytic. OK, not just some kind of incremental change, but they were trying to really revolutionize something. And I think you have to decide whether you want to be you know, slow and steady incremental change or whether you really want to change something uh you know i was going to say bigly i've been <laughs> indoctrinated by a certain person here but you know if you really want to change it on a big scale and make it a sort of revolutionary change as opposed to incremental then you know try and identify something that you can use your skills to to do that into and if you have a, a book that you would recommend that's been really inspiring oh. for your career well um, different things at different times but um something i've been uh, uh reading recently uh is uh stephen pinker uh, Enlightenment Now. And this is a book, it's not really about environment, it does talk a bit about environment, but what it, the basic premises of it is that, you know, many, many things that we think are doom and gloom are actually way better now than they've ever been in history. You know, and he starts off with, uh, with uh, President Obama's quote, which is, you know, if you, if you didn't know who you were, what country you lived in, what your status was, and you chose a time to be born, it would be today. Because on average, we're better off you know, in many different ways. Now, the one exception that I would argue is the environment. So, you know, if you look at things like longevity of human beings, apparently now it's 73 across the world. The average is 73, which everybody thinks it's 50 or 60 when you think about mortality, child mortality, things. But it's 73. You know, literacy, all these things are way, way better than we believe them to be. Largely because the media focuses on negative stories. They don't want good news stories. They don't want to they want, oh, there's a crisis here. Not, oh, guess what? There isn't a crisis here. So it's a very interesting book. It gives you a different perspective. And I think it gives you hope that, you know, generally things are moving in the right direction. The big exception he points out is climate change. 
you know, where we really are heading, we're not going in the right direction. There's, there's more awareness, but we're not making the steps we need to solve those problems. And if we tackle that in the same way that we tackle literacy or longevity and disease, then maybe we would get somewhere. I'll be sure to check that out. So thank you for that recommendation. Yeah. The, the British naturalist David Attenborough just released a, a documentary in, in the UK and it just came mm -hmm. out on Netflix in America. Have you had a chance to check right. that out? I haven't. I will check it out. I'm a big, big David Attenborough fan and, uh, you know, uh, he makes wonderful movies. And I am glad, you know, that um, a long time for me we're doing this work. I, I've complained to people like the BBC and Discovery Channel and Nat Geo to say, you know, you, you just showed this wonderful film about how beautiful and amazing this place is and these animals are, but you haven't said anything about what's happening to them. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've heard cases, for example, where, you know, people were filming turtles, this Arabada of turtles in Arista, India, uh, 60,000 turtles arrive. And there's all this wonderful turtles giving birth and things. But that same beach was littered with thousands of dead turtles that have been caught in shrimp trawl nets. And, I, you know, literally every 10 feet, there's another dead turtle. And they were like, no, no, we're not filming that. We, we're not going to film that. But it's like, I think we have a duty to, you know, yes, present the beauty, but also, you know, explain to people this whole thing is very precarious. It's very threatened. And, and it's not just enough to go and enjoy that beauty. You do want to try and get involved in saying, well, let, you know, we, we value this. We want to keep it. And so I'm glad that David Attenborough and a lot of these shows now include that environmental aspect. Because I think viewers can take it. They're like, well, it's, they don't want to think negative. It's like, well, it's just called reality. And sometimes reality is a bit negative. And I think we all need a dose of reality occasionally. Agreed. And, and it was, I have had the chance to check it out. It is very sobering, but also at the very end, you know, gave a lot of positive stories, like you said before, that it's not all so, doom and gloom. It's... I think that's the key is you don't leave people on doom and gloom. Okay. Mm. And I think, you know, that I think is, is the message and why we've had some success is we're not saying this is hopeless. We're saying in our messaging, you know, you've got, this is, you, you stop buying this, you're going to help, right? You can solve this problem. If you, you stop buying it, you tell your friends and relatives to stop buying it, you can help solve this problem. And so it's not a doom and gloom thing. It's like, there's an opportunity to solve this. So in closing, how can people help you? What, what can people do to get behind what you do? Well, please check out our website, wildaid.org. Um, you know, we have, uh, well, of course, we take donations from anywhere in the world. That's wonderful. But, you know, we also have things now. We have a petition uh, at endthetrade.com to end the live wildlife markets. People can do that. Uh, from time to time, there's legislation which we need to get pushed through in different places. Um, you know, in terms of endangered species, you know, if you do go abroad and things, don't buy wildlife products generally, you know, because, you know, unless you're confident this is something that is sustainably sourced, let's put it that way, which is often very hard to tell, don't buy wildlife products. You know, so people in the States and, and in Europe, you know, sometimes will go and buy a turtle shell object mm -hmm. that's on sale legally somewhere. Maybe sometimes in ignorance, people don't understand, but be careful about buying any wildlife products if you're traveling abroad. Okay, well, we're going to leave our viewers with a short film on, on what you guys do, but we wanted to okay. thank you so much for the important work you and your organization are doing, and thank, thank you. you for your time today, Peter. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care. Our approach is not about scientific study or boots on the ground, both of which are important, but it's about addressing public perception and the economic forces behind the illegal wildlife trade. While everyone else was focusing on the supply side, we dared to ask, what if you can reduce the demand for these products? This goes straight to the root of the problem. This is a pangolin. This endangered animal is largely overlooked, but in fact, is the most trafficked mammal in the world. So we looked at how businesses the world over stimulate demand, and we adapted the same techniques to reduce demand for wildlife products. Just as companies use high-profile spokespeople to promote their products, we have more than 300 global and local icons as ambassadors around the world, including China, Vietnam, and the United States. Some people call this a souvenir. We use all the standard advertising technique. Send me a selfie instead. From award-winning 30-second messages, master the panda kung fu move of saying no way to full-length documentaries to massive billboard and social media campaigns because we have high quality materials major star power behind us and we're not asking people for money in our messages we've been able to leverage more than one billion dollars of donated media space mostly in china over 200 million dollars a year 
Campaigns take time. You can't just say we're going to do a six month campaign. You have to keep going until you achieve the change that you need. Our campaign has been one of the longest running and most viewed campaigns ever. When the buying stops, reaching hundreds of millions of people worldwide over the past two decades. The cooling can too. But we're seeing some remarkable progress. Shark fin imports to China are down 80%. The Galapagos, where officials were once seizing up to 10,000 shark fins at a time, is now home to the densest shark population in the world. Ivory and rhino horn prices have been reduced by two thirds. Rhino poaching is slowing down in South Africa, but not fast enough. Elephant poaching has started to decline, coming down dramatically in East Africa. However, our work is far from over. Her name is Boromoko, but I call her the million dollar baby, because over her lifetime, that is how much tourism revenue she can bring to Kenya. As we continue working on eliminating demand, we're now using the same model to get much broader public and political support for conservation in Africa, the last stamp of so much of the world's iconic wildlife. So let's all sing the same song. Stand up for our wildlife. And we're ambassadors of Wild, wild Day. Africans are speaking out and showing their support for protecting their wildlife and their national parks. So we're leveraging media space on a massive scale and are currently the only conservation charity to have a 100% four-star rating with Watchdog Charity Navigator. We need your help more than ever. Join us in fighting to protect our incredible wildlife. Because poaching steals from us all. To learn more, visit wildaid.org. Hi, my name is Kirsty. If you enjoyed the content today and would like to watch more videos like this, please subscribe to our social media channels or join us at www.f.live forward slash join. <laughs>